This lecture is going to focus on how we can read Genesis 3. So the last couple of lectures have looked at Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis 1 focusing on the kingship of God and, and this understanding of creation um, and really seeing Genesis 1 as talking about the identity of God, who is God, and even focusing on this, this kind of polemic against the ancient forms of mythology and the ways in which Genesis 1 um, fights against Egyptian mythology and the Babylonian mythology. It uses some of the same symbols, but it is trying to say this is who the true God is, the creator of, of all things. Genesis 2, we talked about um, how it focuses on Eden and a, a temple motif, Adam as a high priest, um, covenant, and the relationships, and what it means to be made in the image of God. And Genesis 2 and 3 are meant to be read together as a unit. Um, the focus on the fall is connected with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that we find in the garden. Uh, the serpent that is going to tempt Eve and Adam. Um, and then the consequences of, of disobedience that disrupt this life that we saw in Genesis 2. So we need to read these, these two chapters uh, together. So what kind of questions does the text raise? If you were to read through the text, and, and I want you to, if you could read through Genesis 3, uh, and if you and if we were having a face-to-face -face course, what we what I would do is I'd have you read the text, and then I would ask you, you know, what questions um, pop up? What questions do you have as you actually read it and hear the text? One of the questions that always pops up uh, in this context is, what what is the tree of no the knowledge of good and evil? And why is it there? Why does God put it in the garden? Um, a lot of times students struggle with this because it seems as though God is, is the author of sin by creating this tree and, and putting it in the garden. Now what I'd like you to do is think differently about this. And as we think symbolically about this text, don't think that I'm denying that there was an Adam and an Eve and a Garden of Eden and all of that. These, these things are grounded in events that happen. But again, as I've said all along, what we're getting in the text is a description of these events that speak to why they're meaningful. So it's not just trying to tell us this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. But there is meaning in the very language that is used to try to talk about these events. So when I talk about the symbolism of Genesis 3, don't take that to mean that I'm denying uh, its historicity. Um, but it is important to, to recognize the power of the language of the text and what the text is actually trying to do once again. So what does the tree of the knowledge of good and evil represent? Well, what the tree does is it becomes this barrier between cr creature and creator. Barriers may be the wrong word. It, it becomes this distinction. God is the creator. God is the one who brings all things into existence. And the things that are brought into existence are creatures. And even though humans are made in the image of God, we are not the creator. We represent the creator. We're given a sense of dignity by the creator. But we are not the ones who get to determine what is good and evil. So think about knowledge of good and evil here, not as knowing the difference between right and wrong, because Adam and Eve did. God said, don't eat of the tree. Automatically, it creates the difference between obedience and disobedience. They knew what was right and what was wrong. But think of knowledge in the terms of intimacy, being able to determine what is right and what is wrong. And that's what the tree signifies. God is the one who determines what is right and wrong, good and evil. God is the creator. Therefore, humans are not allowed to eat from the tree because it is not for them. Um, it is to cross over and overstep our boundaries as creatures to take from this, from this tree. And there I, you can see it on the slide. To take the fruit is to cross our boundary as creatures. So what does the tree represent? Well, in some ways, what we get here in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and God's prohibition of it is kind of a prefiguring of the law. Uh, remember we talked about covenant, God is the one who acts, but then expects faithfulness and obedience from his people. 
Well, here we find God creating a space for people to live and to live in the garden. But then gives his word. Do not eat from this tree. Right? The tree signifies the law that speaks to the identity of the creator as the one who gets to determine right and wrong. And creatures as those who do not determine what is right and wrong. So here we see that the tree represents identity. It speaks to that part of the covenant that is about obedience. Do not eat from the tree. Obey what God says, and you will stay in the garden, and you will be blessed. But disobey and eat from the tree. Cross that boundary, and you will fall into disobedience, and you will be cursed. And as we have been talking all along already, the curse can be signified also as exile. We see it here in the Genesis 3 text. What is the response of disobedience? Well, they don't die physically, right? Um, the serpent, in some sense, is, is, is twisting the truth. You will not die. They don't die physically. What dies is this relationality, this life that they have in the garden as they're exiled and kicked out of the garden. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. So what does the serpent represent? I think this is important as well. So I want to be careful here because I don't want anyone again to think that to speak symbolically or to speak of metaphor is to deny the historicity of these things. But again, it's, it's a question of what the text is trying to do. So there's a, a story about this woman who comes to uh, this theologian named Karl Barth and says, um, did the serpent really talk? And Barth's response is, the real question isn't whether the serpent could talk. The real question is, what did the serpent say? The text isn't trying to tell us about why serpents talked or didn't talk or whatever. It's more important what the serpent says and what the language is trying to do in the text. Well, the same goes for this, even the fact that there is a serpent here on the tree. What does the serpent represent? Remember back in Genesis 1, we talked about the, the sea monsters, that God is the one who created these creatures. They've gone bad, right? There's something wrong, um, but God is the one who, who created them. We have to read the serpent in the context of these kind of sea creatures. So the serpent or the dragon becomes an ancient mythological symbol. It's connected with um, a very kind of ancient symbol of chaos and, and evil and temptation that you find in all kinds of other, of other myths. Um, this, the serpent comes to represent the enemy of God and God's people. If we read in Isaiah, I believe it's Isaiah 27 or something like that, he speaks about Rahab, and Rahab is this mythological creature, this monster. I mean, think about the story of Columbus and the fears that they would, you know, uh, sail off the end of the earth, or that there was these great sea creatures and monsters in the deep that would that would would get them. This is the kind of fear uh, that is grounded in this kind of ancient mythological understanding of what is in the water. The water symbolizing evil and chaos and darkness, and the things that reside in the water, these monsters, um, came mythologically to represent the enemy. Um, chaos, destruction. And we see it in Isaiah. We see it in the book of Job at the end when he talks about Leviathan and Behemoth. These are not dinosaurs. These are not hippos. They're not alligators. Uh, these are ancient mythological creatures. And it's significant what Job is, is saying and, and the Lord is saying about these creatures in Job. We see it again in the book of Revelation, where the beast of the sea and the dragon are the enemies of God's people. And again, Revelation needs to be read very symbolically. It's the type of writing that it is. So here in Genesis 3, we see the presence of this kind of serpent that symbolizes the enemy of God and the enemy of, of God's, God's people. It's also important to recognize, as we did in one of the last lectures, focus on Pharaoh, right, and the serpent from the head. And so there's Egyptian connections here as well. Pharaoh and Egypt representing the enemy of God's people. And eventually Babylon will, will come to uh, represent that as well. So it's important to, to recognize that the serpent functions symbolically here as a way to speak to kind of the intrusion of the enemy once again into the garden. Now, we all these questions pop up. 
How did the serpent get there? Um, why is if it's a perfect place? How did it happen? Um, if God is all powerful, then why is the serpent there? Is, is God the author of sin? The problem with the Genesis text, and it, actually, it's not the problem with the Genesis text. It's our problem, is we. The text isn't trying to answer these questions. So again, if you go to a text with the wrong questions, you come up with crazy answers. Um, what the text is trying to get at here is what happens? Um, how does humanity fall? How does humanity come into exile? And really all in the context of, of Egypt. Think about the Israelites asking, how did we end up here? How did we end up in the desert? Where are we headed? Who, who is this God? What is the problem? And Genesis is, is, in some sense, giving backstory to the experience of the Israelites. Now, can we say the serpent represents Satan or Lucifer? This is a tricky question. On the one hand, it's important to, to realize that the author most likely doesn't intend it to refer to Satan or Lucifer. Satan doesn't come along until much later in the Old Testament narrative. Uh, in some ways, you could talk about it being a development. Um, in the first five books of the Bible, you don't find resurrection, you don't find references to Satan, Lucifer. Those things all kind of come later on in the Old Testament revelation. So in one way, you can answer that the serpent here at the beginning of, of Genesis, in the Genesis 3, um, is not necessarily Satan or Lucifer. Now, stay with me. Because on another hand, we can, we can say, yes, it is it does represent Satan and Lucifer, that we can read Satan and Lucifer back into the text um, as we come across Satan and Lucifer, Satan or Lucifer later on, um, in, in, later in the Old Testament and, and as we get into the New Testament. So I hope my answer make, to that makes sense. Um, the big answer is yes, I think we can and, and should. And at the same time, it's significant when we take the Genesis 3 text and read it um, to realize that there are other things that are going on here and other references that, that are being made. The important point here is to see that the serpent represents the enemy of God's people, which later on is definitely Satan and Lucifer. And that's why we can read, read that back into to the text. But it's important to read Genesis 3 for what it is and what it is trying to say. I hope that makes sense. And if you have any questions about that or need clarity, um, please don't be afraid to email me or, or stop by and, and talk to me. All right, so theologically, how should we read the text? Well, what's happening in Genesis 3, remember back in the other slide, we talked about how our relationships, to be a human being is to be in relationship with God, creation, others, and self. And we had the arrows going out. Our life comes from outside of ourselves. Augustine and Martin Luther use the example of umbilical cords, that the, from these, our hum, humanity, our relationship to God, creation, and other self become the source of life for us. What happens when they eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and their eyes are opened is that these outward movements get turned inward. Luther and Augustine refer to this as the curvature of the self in and upon the self. Rather than a movement outward, our movement is inward. We glorify the self. We're trapped within ourself. We cannot get outside of ourself. We think of ourselves as self-sufficient. We don't need God. We don't need other people. And we abuse and misuse others and the creation uh, for our own gain. What we'll see throughout Scripture is that this direct, directedness, this broken directedness, becomes the nature of sin and, and the disobedience of God's people. Throughout the Old Testament, the temptation is to constantly put our trust in our own power, rather than trust in God. Um, throughout Scripture, the temptation uh, is to love ourself and elevate ourself and focus on uh, our own power of reason, or our own control, um, rather than loving our neighbor and being opened up, opened up to our neighbor. So we need to see that that when the serpent talks about you will be like God, he's again it's a twisting of the truth. Um, it's to say that you will become, you will determine what is right and wrong. You get to be the one who decides. And so that relationship between the the creator and the creature gets cut off as the creature begins to elevate itself 
um, into a godlike status. We'll see this in the Tower of Babel story, right? Why are they creating the tower? To make a name for themselves, and in some ways they're trying to scare God, to say, leave us alone. We, we don't want anything to do with you. So this temptation and this problem becomes the problem of sin and the problem of, of Scripture. And we'll see this problem unfold through the entire biblical story. So again, you will be like God. Think about Adam and Eve and think about the relationships. They're cut off from those relationships that give them life. Remember we said that God is the one who breathed into them the breath of life so that human life depends upon a relationship with God. And what happens? They hide from God in Genesis 3. Right? What They feel shame. God says, where are you and why are you hiding? And, and Adam and Eve say, we were naked and we're ashamed. And God's like, well, who told you you were naked? They come to a self-awareness. Right? They're focused inwardly now upon themselves. And so this nudity becomes um, a sign of, of their shame in that broken relationship. They blame each other. Adam says, the woman you put here with me. Remember in Genesis 2, there's a hymn of praise that is sung. Adam sees the woman and breaks into a song, breaks into a hymn of praise in Genesis 2. There's mutuality, there's relationship. And here in Genesis 3, he blames her, the woman you put here with me, even though it's important to point out, the Genesis text makes it very clear that Adam was with Eve when she was taking of the tree. So we can't blame Eve fully. Adam and Eve are equally responsible for the eating of the tree because Adam knew better. Adam could have stepped in and prevented it from, from taking place. But here Adam blames Eve, and there's a wedge that is now stuck between us as human beings. The ground is cursed. All right, Cursed is the ground because of you. Thorns and thistles uh, it will produce. So work becomes toil. Right, the, the, Instead of caring for the garden and living in the garden, they're now kicked out of the garden, and they will toil to, in their relationship with the created world. And then they are sent into exile. And this is a, a picture of that exile. They are kicked out of the garden. The garden is the temple, the presence of God in creation. They are sent away from God's presence. Um, and so we'll see how in the, in the history of Israel, this notion of exile and curse becomes very, very important. The Adam story replays itself in the Israel story. And eventually the Israel, that all replays itself in the Jesus story. We have to come to see the cross as God entering into the curse, entering into exile, uh, in order to lead his people, in order to lead his people out. So disobedience leads to exile, and the kicking them out of the garden signifies that humanity has broken the covenant. And remember, we did all of that stuff with, with Richter, where redemption is a family member who has been lost has been brought back in. So this is establishing the foundation for that understanding of redemption in the biblical story. Now, it's also important to recognize that the Genesis account, in Genesis 3, we find um, an emphasis on God's grace. We see it in God's search for Adam and Eve. When they're hiding from him, he calls out to them, where are you? Now, if I could get into a pastoral moment for a minute, this is the same question God asks of us. God is searching for us. Again, that redemption motif, right? Those who are outside of the family. God is searching for us. Um, Karl Barth talks about sending the Son into the far country, sends the Son out in the incarnation to come and to find us and to grab hold of us and to bring us home. This is the promise of redemption. God searches for us to bring us home and to bring us back into covenant. And this is the biblical story. Uh, the biblical story is the story of God's search for his people. And here we see in this, this painting here of this is Christ. Um, with Eve and and with and with Adam, um, and again signifying this notion of of um, of promise and presence and and redemption. Now it's important also to emphasize that the Bible is the story of three gardens, and I think we see this um, here at the beginning with um, Genesis three. We see the first garden in Genesis 2 and 3. But it's also important to see how Christ comes as the second Adam. Um, and so the Garden of Gethsemane and the Resurrection Garden 
we could talk about the Bible being the story of these three gardens. That in Eden, what we find is the first Adam glorifies himself. See, the man has become like one of us. By taking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, humanity oversteps his boundaries, declares himself to be God, and seeks not after God's will, but his own will. Gethsemane, the second Adam, Jesus Christ, submits himself to God's will. If you remember, and you could read this in Luke, Luke's gospel specifically, um, Jesus is there, he's struggling, and finally says, not my will, but yours. It's important that both that this takes place in a garden. It's connecting us to Eden. In the first garden, the first Adam glorifies himself. In the second garden, in Gethsemane, the second Adam submits himself, working to undo what Adam, the first Adam, had done. And then the third garden is the resurrection garden. In John 20, when Mary comes looking for the body of Jesus and it's not there, and she meets the resurrected Christ and thinks he's a gardener. What's significant about this is what John is trying to tell us is that Mary is, in her misrecognition, actually correct. Jesus is a gardener. Think about Adam. Adam is the first gardener. Adam and Eve is the first gardeners to care and till the garden and care for it. And here comes Jesus out of the tomb as the resurrected humanity. The new Adam. The new humanity. The restored humanity. It's significant that all of this stuff takes place in a garden. And we can shoot an arrow from the Garden of Eden through the Promised Land into Gethsemane and into um, the resurrection garden where the new Adam comes from the, two, from the tomb. So it's important to see how the Genesis account from 1 to 3 sets the stage now for the biblical story of redemption. We get creation. We get covenant. We have the grace of God and the presence of God with his people in the garden. We have a fall where humanity is tempted and oversteps their boundaries and begins to glorify themselves. The problem that's going to continue through the entire biblical story, through Israel and Israel's kings with David. And finally, in Jesus Christ, that cycle is broken and a new humanity, a new humanity is created. But before we get to the New Testament, we have to, we have to move to Abraham because the story is shooting ahead to Abraham. The promise of grace that's given in Genesis 3 um, the crushing of the serpent's head, right, is in some sense fulfilled by Abraham and the people and the promise of the people and the promise of covenant, which becomes the restoration of covenant in Jesus Christ.